Here, at the foot of the Moab Mountains, the impressive ruins of St. Euthymius Monastery are still standing. It was here, in this semi-arid wilderness, that St. Euthymius, an Armenian bishop from Melitine, founded his Anchoritic Monastery at the end of the 4th century AD with 12 disciples. Actually, the pioneers of the desert monasticism were Armenians, uh, and the most famous figure would be St. Euthymius. Uh, we find in Greek sources that there were hundreds of Armenian monks in the desert, besides, of course, the Greeks, Cappadocians and Georgians. This movement brought tens of thousands of monks to the Judean and Moab mountains, and especially to the desert between Bethlehem and Jericho. A large number of the monks were Armenians, and some of these Armenians rose to become the superiors of illustrious monasteries. It was in these monasteries during the 5th century that the Jerusalem lectionary was translated into Armenian, producing a remarkable and unique book called the Armenian Lectionary. This is the first document of its kind in the Holy Land, giving the specific details of the liturgies at the holy places and intended as a guide for the monks and worshippers of the time. So Armenians have preserved a lot of the ritual tradition of the early church of Jerusalem, which they have carried also to Armenia. In apostolic times, Armenia was evangelized by the apostles Thaddeus and Bartholomew. For centuries, Christianity was practiced clandestinely until it became the official religion of the country in 301 by the edict of King Tiridates III. The Armenians were the first nation to accept Christianity as a state religion, not as a country, but as a state religion. When the king became a Christian, he was baptized by Saint Gregory the Illuminator in the year 301. From the year 301, Armenian pilgrims flocked to Palestine traveling across the country and going as far as Sinai. Their presence is documented in the letters of St. Jerome in 386. But basically these monasteries were built in order to make, to facilitate uh, the passage and the voyage of travelers. Because most, um, if they came by ship, they would um, come to Jaffa. This is for the maritime roads. But some people came by land, so we had like hospices which were monasteries uh, in Aleppo, in Latakia, in Gaza. Uh, so there was the maritime road and the uh, road, uh, you know, land road. Some pilgrims left costly memorials, like ornate mosaic floors, as testimonies to their passage through the Holy Land. St. Gregory the Illuminator, the founder of the Armenian Church, was educated in Caesarea. He was steeped in the Byzantine tradition. So Armenian Christianity was forged and enriched by intensive contacts with the ancient Syrian and Byzantine churches. The language and alphabets of these churches were adopted by the Armenians before the emergence of their own distinct language in the 5th century, following the invention of their alphabet by the monk Mesrop Mashtots. Immediately after the adoption of Christ, uh, Christianity, the Armenians wanted to have their own script and they invented one. Furthermore, the Armenian church was profoundly inspired by its experience in the Holy Land. 50 years after the adoption of Christianity, Armenians were in the Holy Land trying to witness uh, the story of the Lord. And uh, Jerusalem was in big inspiration for Armenia and actually all the texts from Jerusalem traveled to Armenia and our liturgy was based on the liturgy of Jerusalem. Actually the link between Palestine and Armenia extends over 1600 years. There was considerable cross-fertilization. Palestine reinforced the development of the new Armenian faith against the Zoroastrianism of neighboring Persia. As Armenia was always surrounded by non-Christians, and um, to assert its identity, it developed uh, and deepened its Christian identity. Armenia was also one of the most ardent advocates of a universal Christian dogma. 
Like the other early churches, Armenians rejected every kind of heresy. The heads of the Armenian church participated in all the early church councils, including Nicaea, Ephesus and Constantinople. The church did not adopt the resolution of the Council of Chalcedon, mainly for political reasons, thus rejecting Byzantium's attempt to assimilate all other church traditions. There was a large flow of pilgrims and monks between Armenia and the Holy Land. Like the Byzantine ecclesiastical community, the Armenians enjoyed a special status of immunity in Jerusalem, which was originally granted by Caliph Omar in 638 and later confirmed by Saladin after the departure of the Crusaders. The Armenians, therefore, also played an important role in the upkeep of the holy places. As Christian faithful, they used their influence with different administrations to improve the position and status of Christians in the Holy Land. As the Crusades happened, now, geographically, the Crusades had to pass through Armenia and there uh, this, uh, uh, develop, uh, this relationship developed between the Armenians and the Crusaders, which was basically a solidarity movement by the Armenians towards their Western brothers. And uh, uh, normally, as the Armenian kingdom was the only kingdom in the area, uh, relations, matrimonial relations developed between the Jerusalem Kingdom and the Armenian Kingdom, and the first three queens were Armenian. The Middle Ages witnessed the intensification of contacts between Armenia and the West. Among the catalysts for this were the royal marriages, which kept multiplying. Latin became one of the languages of the Armenian court. This rapprochement with the West, involving close contacts with the Catholic Church, occurred between 1100 and 1375, during the existence of the Kingdom of Lesser Armenia, or Cilicia, which was situated in Asia Minor on the Mediterranean Sea. We had uh, communities uh, of Italians, Venetians, Pisans and Genoese in uh, the Armenian Kingdom in the 11th, 12th century, uh, which this relationship continued with Italy. So with two uh, European nations, mainly France, and Italy, we have at least 1,000 years of relationship. Under the Ottoman Empire, while in principle still enjoying special immunity in Jerusalem, the Armenian community had to struggle to maintain her identity, as did the other churches. Many new rules regarding the Christian subjects were imposed. But there was a time when we had 72 churches and monasteries in the Holy Land. But uh, because we were weak and we couldn't get any help, since 13th century, 14th century, sorry, we didn't, we didn't have any political leaders. And Armenia was cut off, uh, 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 the communication was cut off between Armenia and Jerusalem Armenians. So we were just left by ourselves. Uh, there were uh, uh, very bad uh, times, uh, 14th century, 15th century, especially when the Turks arrived. So visitation to the Holy Land was not that easy in those years. In 1854, the introduction of status quo rules regulating liturgical services and rites of possession in the holy places mitigated tensions among the Christian communities and defined the important role of the Armenians. Status quo means the, the, holy, uh, the, the rights of the, the communities as it, as it is, you know, as it was uh, accepted during 1850s. There has been an organized Armenian community in Palestine since the 5th century. Many pilgrims fell in love with the land and stayed on. The Armenian quarter in Jerusalem originated as an extensive network of dwellings for pilgrims. The Armenian quarter presently comprises one-sixth of the total area within the walls of the old city. The Armenian Patriarchate of Jerusalem traces itself back to the 7th century and is one of the four seats of the Armenian church. Its jurisdiction extends over all of Palestine, Israel and Jordan. It sees its main vocation as the maintenance of the holy places, principally the churches of the Nativity and the Holy Sepulchre. Three times a week, as determined by the status quo agreement, 
Armenian monks and young Armenian seminarians lead a liturgical procession in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that passes through the Chapel of St. Helena, also known as the Chapel of St. Gregory the Illuminator. We are the guardians, along with the Catholic Church, the Franciscan uh, brothers, and the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate. One of the more important institutions in the Patriarchate is its 200-year-old seminary. Many generations of clergy have been formed here before being sent to different parts of the Armenian diaspora. The Armenian community also has a secondary school, which was established in 1869. It was the first co-educational school in Jerusalem. Two intellectual institutions have accompanied the Armenian intellectual endeavor in the Holy Land, the Manuscript Library and the Gulbenkian Public Library. The Manuscript Library is as old as the Monastery of the Patriarchate, which is actually one of the oldest active monasteries in the Holy Land. It contains approximately 4,000 ancient manuscripts, some dating back to the 8th century. Many patristic texts have survived only in Armenian translations, so many scholars come from all over the world to consult them. It is a repository for centuries of monastic scholarship. The Gulbenkian Library houses a total of 120,000 volumes. Armenians were the first uh, uh, nation to have a printing press in the Holy Land. The first printing press was uh, belonged to the Armenians, the 18, uh, beginning of 19th century. Armenians have also contributed to the artistic and artisanal life of Jerusalem. They were pioneers also in the introduction of many crafts and trades. In particular, they have excelled in crafts like photography, ceramics and metalworks not to forget their fine cuisine. We, we deal, the Armenians deal in ceramics in Jerusalem for about 400 years. Uh, they decorated the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. They decorated the Armenian Church of St. James. And they, they decorated also the Church of St. Mark's, which is today Assyrian. It's, it used to be in the hands of the Armenians in the 16th century when it was decorated. A couple of years before the massacre, they brought an Armenian uh, artisan from Turkey also, from Kutahya, to renovate the tiles of the Dome of the Rock. And this person came here and uh, he couldn't go back to Turkey because uh, the massacre started, so he settled in Jerusalem. The jewel of the Armenian quarter of the old city in Jerusalem is the Cathedral of St. James, or rather, of the two great saints, James. The foundations of St. James Cathedral goes back to the 5th century, but the present uh, uh, dimensions are from the Crusader period. It is considered one of the most popular sanctuaries and pilgrimage sites in Jerusalem, as it houses the tombs of St. James the Apostle and St. James the First Bishop of Jerusalem. Among the traditions kept most meticulously by the Armenian Church are the liturgical cycle, the different rituals, and the liturgical calendar. The Armenian liturgy and rituals are very special, not only for their particular form of Armenian language, but also for their unique synthesis of Byzantine and Syriac traditions, with subsequent contributions from the Latin church, expressed especially in the hymns. Armenian liturgy, which is very old, and its variety is very rich. It goes to the beginning of the church, you know, when it was established in Jerusalem. Mainly, we could uh, say that the fourth century, immediately after the Christianity, which was declared as the state religion in Armenia, definitely we started developing our uh, church calendar and the sacraments, and mainly the divine liturgy, which in Armenia we call it Surp. Badarak, or a sacrifice. And uh, it has a one unique form, but in its, uh, it, uh, itself it uh, has uh, several other divine liturg liturgies, St. James, 
the John the uh, basil or John Chrysostom, all it has uh, in a one uh, complete shape. In the medieval ages, of course, because of the close relations with the West, Armenian liturgy had some other parts which was uh, also added. The liturgical language, I mean, it is a very unique language. It is called uh, classical Armenian. In our churches, until today, all our ceremonies is conducted, whether liturgy or other ceremonies, uh, vespers, evening or morning services, all is conducted in classical Armenian. And it has a unique, unique character for praying, for singing. This language, through the, this classical language, that we have been all united and uh, it is a uniting point, I could say, it, for the Armenians. The liturgy is essentially sung, as in other Eastern church traditions. Its origin, Armenian ch church music, therefore, it is a unison, one with a one voice. And until now, for example, certain parts of uh, Armenian churches, the tradition is kept. Early beginning of 19th century, our liturgies has been, you know, developed and uh, harmonized for mixed choirs. In Armenian church traditions, mostly it is a beautifully, I mean, decorated. Uh, we have many hymns that, I mean, it is uh, in a spirit has beautiful spirit of, you know, you know, worshipping. Almost every day, the Armenian church observes the feast for one or more of their local or universal saints, celebrated most meticulously and marked with great pomp and ceremony, are the Dominical Feasts and the Great Week in January, when the feasts of St. James and other important saints are celebrated. Also among the more ceremonious occasions are the various feasts of the cross and the Feast of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary at the end of August, when there is a procession from the Old City to the tomb of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Gethsemane, one of the holy places entrusted to and administered by the Armenians, in this case together with the Greek Orthodox community. But the most impressive celebration of all is Holy Week, during which exquisite vestments and liturgical objects are brought out of the treasury and used. The treasury of St. James Cathedral is very renowned. For more than a millennium, it has accumulated objects of art, mostly donated as gestures of piety. Armenian art in Jerusalem is a byproduct of pilgrimage. It is particularly significant because of the massive destruction of Armenian art during the Armenian Genocide. This is one of the few Armenian collections in the world that remains intact. About a third of the Armenian community of Jerusalem dates back to the Crusader times. The rest came after the genocide and rejuvenated the community. In Palestine as a whole, the number of Armenians doubled after the genocide. Today their number is about 10,000 souls, including 2,000 in Jerusalem. Our number in 48 was 15,000, equally divided between Haifa, Jaffa and Jerusalem. Unfortunately, because of the war, many Armenians became refugees. The number of uh, Armenians uh, uh, worldwide is uh, 7 million, and uh, we have uh, uh, most, uh, I mean, uh, we have a diaspora. Uh, Armenia itself has about uh, 3.2 million. There is a Russian diaspora, and we have a diaspora which is America, France, and Middle East. Following the genocide in the years 1915 to 1917 and the loss of the greater part of historical Armenia and of the heritage of their church, clergy, buildings, possessions, liturgical art and texts, the surviving Armenian communities considered themselves in exile. The Armenian Patriarchate in Jerusalem had a very important role in conserving the history and traditions of the Armenian church. The Armenian Patriarchate also played a fundamental role in the training of new priests and bishops to be sent into the diaspora for the transmission of their ancient culture and identity and in order to perpetuate it 
Armenian communities in the diaspora have founded many old country societies, community centers, sports associations, newspapers and schools. We have like uh, in, the, in the Armenian community or in the convent in Jerusalem, we have uh, scout uh, clubs that they go and they you know, uh, play music over there and they learn some you know, Armenian history over there. Walking through the Armenian quarter in Jerusalem, one feels a strong sense of social identity linked to the preservation of a culture with its ancient customs and traditional way of life. It is like a city within a city. Nevertheless, Armenians are fully integrated in the social and economic life of the holy city and consider themselves full-time Jerusalemites, though they are never forgetful of their Armenian roots. Armenians have a history of strong ecumenical relations with other churches, and especially with the Franciscan friars of the Roman Catholic custody of the Holy Land. Actually, in the Holy Land, we have a special relationship with the Franciscan Church uh, because when, in uh, 1551, when the Franciscan order was um, um, the expelled from the Cenaculum, the Armenians gave uh, seven years of refuge to the Franciscan monks uh, in, in a small monastery here where they could uh, pray uh, as they wished. And I think uh, in Jerusalem, uh, we sometimes talk that we belong to a individual church like Greek, Armenian or Latin, but basically we are one family. The relations uh, with our sister churches here in Jerusalem, uh, I would say are formally cordial. Um, and uh, the churches uh, meet once in a while to discuss common things uh, that relate to them. Well, I would say that uh, the Church of Jerusalem, uh, of course, having uh, in mind those uh, different denominations uh, that form the church in Jerusalem, uh, are, say, the continuation of the Church of Pentecost. Uh, and therefore, uh, the role of the church is to continue uh, spreading the message of the Pentecost, that our Lord is one and he has brought us uh, salvation by preaching his gospel and uh, to be preached the gospel throughout the world. So uh, the message emanated during the Pentecost here in Jerusalem first and uh, the church was established here in Jerusalem. So we believe that uh, all the churches uh, that are part of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ have that call in order to continue the spread of the message throughout the world uh, to other Christian churches. Uh, the church here uh, should serve as a model uh, of uh, love and respect and uh, unity uh, of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ throughout the world. Of course, I mean, if the light came out from uh, the ho uh, Holy Sepulchre of Jesus, things also should come out from here. Today, the Armenian Orthodox Church, which also likes to be known as the Armenian Apostolic Church, remains faithful to her historical role of being a bridge between the Eastern and the Western churches and traditions. She affirms that she is open to full communion with other churches, but without compromising her own traditions and strong sense of identity. She sees ecumenism as the communion between churches that recognize each other's richness and individuality. The Armenian Church, since the very first day of its inception, believed in the oneness of the Church. We, in the Apostolic Creed, or the Nicene Creed, we repeat every, during every Mass, we believe in one, Apostolic Universal Church. We as an Armenian Church 
uphold the principle of uh, uh, unity in essentials and liberty in secondary things, uh, which means that uh, what is fundamental uh, for to keep the unity of the church is to have the same faith uh, in general, but also to have the freedom uh, of worship of our Lord uh, by uh, our own language, culture, ritual. We think that uh, the Pope, who is the bishop of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, could be the first among equals and not uh, superior to others. We believe in oneness of the Church. Of course, there are the first among the, the equals. In that uh, scope, we, uh, we uh, accept that somebody has to be the first among the equals. The Church has to be one. The, the, there should be one order in the Church and one theology. One baptism, we repeat in ba one baptism. In Jerusalem, the relationship between the Armenian Orthodox Church and her Armenian Catholic sister church is good. Belonging to a purely Christian nation and as Christians of profound faith, the solidarity between Armenians is very strong and transcends all other considerations. For other churches, the Armenian Church is, in many ways, a model of a martyr church maintaining her loyalty to Christ through the centuries in the midst of many difficulties, both as a church and as a nation, and like the phoenix, being reborn again and again. We didn't give up easily. One of the big achievements of the Armenian people as a people uh, that uh, uh, they lasted in history. And about a few years ago, we celebrated 1,700 years of uh, Christian faith not in easy conditions, uh, basically. Uh, so if you continue to believe in the Lord, the Lord will accompany you in, in, in history. That's our strength.